All right, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's dual webinar, Pushing the Size Limits, Size and Input Limits of DNA Fragment Library Prep and Streamlining NGS Library Prep with Automation. My name is Rob Brazos. I'm a product manager here at LGC Lucigen, and I'd like to welcome you all today. We're excited you're here. After, we've actually got two webinars today. So after the first webinar, we'll take your questions regarding that webinar. And then at the end of the second webinar, uh, we'll take your questions uh, after that one's completed. So uh, as I said, our uh, we have two webinars today, and our first speaker is Scott Modsma. Uh, Scott has been with LGC Lucigen for the past four years, working in NGS product development and bioinformatics, and he's currently the director of NGS services. Uh, his webinar is titled, Pushing the Limits of Next-Gen Sequencing, Libraries from the Ultra-Limited and Ultra-Small. Uh, you may have recalled, you may recall that we did a webinar not too long ago about, not too long ago about the NextSeq Ultra-Low kit. Um, Scott's going to expand on that with this new um, set of applications that we've developed. And then our second speaker today is Phil Farrelly. He's the CEO and uh, founder of Hudson Robotics. Uh, we've been working with Phil and his team at Hudson Robotics to automate the NextSeq AMP-free low DNA library kit. Very similar to kit that we're talking about, that uh, Scott will be talking about today, um, but it's a PCR-free kit. Um, Phil's going to talk about uh, automating that system on their, excuse me, automating that library prep on their system. And Phil's webinar is titled Solving Library Prep Challenges Through Automation. So let's um, just get started. And um, remember, please enter all your questions in the chat window, and uh, we'll answer them in after each webinar. Thanks, and uh, enjoy the uh, two webinars. OK, so today I'm going to talk about um, pushing the limits of next generation sequencing, uh, building libraries from ultra limited inputs and ultra small fragments. My next, my first slide is the agenda. Um, we're going to talk about factors that affect library quality when you're working with very low input amounts. Um, I'll spend a little time talking about duplication in your read outputs and uh, maintaining library complexity when you work with 50 picograms. And then I'm going to switch gears and talk about very small inserts. We've done some work on tweaking the protocol <clears throat> to work with <clears throat> 10 uh, base pair and up inserts, and I'll show you some real data working with CFDNA. So this first slide is an overview of the library prep uh, sequence for Illumina sequencers. Basically, you're taking your genomic DNA and fragmenting it. You then go through an end repair A tail and uh, ligate adapters on. And then you can either sequence directly with our AMP-free kit or a PCR-free protocol, or if you have lower input, use PCR to amplify the amount of material you're putting on the sequencer. So in the best case, in the perfect world, your genomic DNA contains a whole bunch of different types of sequences. When you fragment it and repair the ends and ligate adapters, all of those fragments would get captured and would show up in your sequencing output. But we live in the real world, and unfortunately, at every stage of this process, uh, factors can reduce the complexity of the library. So during the end repair A tail, some of these ends are not going to get fixed, and some of them may not get the A added on. So when you go to the adapter ligation stage, you end up with fragments that only get one adapter or maybe no adapter. And the ligation itself can have variable um, efficiency. So some of these fragments, even if they had good ends, might not get adapters ligated onto them. And so the end result is when you look at your sequencing data, you have dropout of some of these fragments. And the worse this end repair and ligation, the more of these will drop out. So complexity of your library can suffer at every stage of the preparation. And high quality reagents can really help increase the efficiency of the capture of those fragments. I'm going to talk a little bit about sequencing duplicates. Uh, there are actually multiple sources that can yield identical sequences in your output, um, in your output files. So the first is biological duplicates. If you're making library from many copies of a genome, just by random chance, you can have exactly the same ends on your fragments. And these will be actual uh, 
two distinct copies, but they look exactly the same. Using PCR, of course, PCR is intended to create copies, but if you sequence deep enough, you will see many, many copies of exactly the same sequence. So PCR duplicates uh, is a necessary evil of working with uh, low input. Uh, another type of duplicate arises on the sequencer itself. Uh, the clusters can be interpreted by the sequencer as two, dif two different clusters and read twice, and so you'll get two identical sequences. And this is mainly on the uh, HiSeq and MySeq. When you move to patterned flow cells on the newer Illumina sequencers, there's uh, a factor called XAMP duplication. So XAMP is the process of making the clusters in the wells, and during that process, one of the templates can come loose and seed adjacent empty wells. And so here we're showing fragment number two has actually broken loose and seeded multiple times. And so this is going to show up as a huge duplication of fragment number two. And this is about um, 5 to 8 percent of reads typically on a HiSeq X. Uh, we've seen it even range up above 20 percent. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind when you're doing pattern flow cell sequencing. Uh, some real data. Um, you can see more duplication as you sample more reads from any given library. So here we've made three different libraries from three input amounts from E. coli using 16, 13, or 4 PCR cycles, and then sampled to different depths uh, from that one library, and look at the number of duplicates that we can see. And so you, you can see with the 50 picogram library, if we're sampling 300,000 reads, which is about 10x, we have a low apparent duplication level. If we sample up towards 100x coverage from that same library, we can see duplication coming up to about 6%. With the higher input levels, the effect isn't quite so apparent. Um, so I think the take home here is try to use the most DNA that you can where possible. And if you're comparing library prep kits especially, uh, it's really important to use one sample for all of the different libraries that you're going to make and try to use identical DNA input amounts and identical uh, PCR cycles. Okay, I'm going to switch gears uh, now and talk, well, not quite switch gears. We're going to talk about why do you care about making libraries from low inputs. So not all samples are limitless. So uh, you may be working with uh, genomic DNA from FFPE samples. Uh, you might be working with soil metagenomic samples or um, circulating or cell-free DNA preps. Uh, or you might be using bisulfite sequencing, which really degrades the DNA and can reduce the amount of input that you have available to make the library with. So I'm going to show you some data that we've made using our ultra-low DNA library kit. Um, the advantages of this kit are you can go down to 50 picogram of uh, DNA, or you can put as much as 75 nanograms into it. Um, we have very low bias, and we've shown uh, application in a number of different areas. Um, so I want to show you some complexity data. This is human libraries that we made from 10 nanograms with our kit versus competitor kits. And after going through downsampling to 10x coverage, mapping the reads, and then looking at the library complexity, um, our ultra-low kit came out with the highest library complexity estimated by Picard, uh, which indicates the um, higher efficiency of ligation and recovery of unique fragments. The next slide shows the actual data uh, of the mapping. We downsampled to 200 million reads for about 10x coverage. Our ultra-low kit, we had a higher percentage of reads mappable. We also had a longer fragment length captured, so both the Kappa and the NEB kit had slightly smaller insert sizes after the selection. And the ultra-low gave the lowest uh, duplicates as well. So I just want to talk a bit more about the complexity. Um, the complexity of the sample itself can impact the number of duplicates that you'll observe depending on how deeply you sequence it. So with a human genome um, at six gigabases for a diploid genome, 
if you break that up into 300 base pair fragments, you only have a possibility of 20 million or so unique fragments. Um, one genome is about 6 picograms, so if we're working with 50 picograms, that's only about 8.3 diploid genomes. And in that, the best you could possibly get is 166 million fragments unique. Now, if you take that and put that on a HiSeq X, on one lane, you're going to have about 450 million clusters. There's not enough unique fragments here to fill up that many clusters, so it's going to be filled with duplicates. So just on this theoretical basis, you would expect about 63% duplication if you took 166 million over 450 million. The next slide shows some actual data um, that we did with FFPE samples and matched uh, genomic DNA samples. Uh, at the top is 50 picograms input and then 17 nanograms or 50 nanograms. And you can see in the duplicates after downsampling and mapping with the 50 picogram inputs, we had um, approximately 90% duplication rate. Even though the percent of aligned reads is good, uh, in the end, the overall coverage is very low. And we had a lot of missing uh, spots. So um, when using human DNA to maintain complexity, you really need to use more input to, um, to get complete coverage. Um, but if you're working with microbial genomes, uh, you're perfectly well off going down to 50 picograms. So here's a, a range of libraries made with 50 up to 75, 50 picogram up to 75 nanogram genomic DNA from E. coli. Uh, we've downsampled again down to 10x coverage on the genome. And our apparent duplication rate for 50 picograms, even with 16 cycles of PCR for E. coli, the duplication rate is still below 1%. So with small genomes, using 50 picogram is still many thousands of copies of genomes, and so there's um, adequate complexity there. Okay, now I want to switch gears and talk about the small inserts. Uh, we've made some tweaks to the ultra-low protocol uh, that can enable um, capturing very, very small fragments. Um, a lot of natural samples that might have very small fragments would, again, be FFPE samples, ancient DNA, uh, liquid biopsy or CF DNA, metagenomic samples, and so on. Um, as well, CHIP and uh, microcockal nuclease CHIP to um, narrow down the binding site specificity uh, will yield very small fragments, and you want very efficient capture of those small fragments. So I'm going to walk through some data we generated with synthetic oligos. Um, but first, okay, the problem is when you're working with full-sized Y adapters, as in most Illumina kits and many competitors, uh, the adapter dimer size itself is about 120 bases. And if you ligate a small insert of, say, 25 bases into that, the total size that you want to capture is 146 base, pa base pairs. So bead cleanup has uh, no capability to really cut between the adapter dimer and your desired fragment. Um, that's shown on this next slide with different concentrations of beads added to the cleanup. Uh, the primer dimer would run right about this red line at 120 base pairs. So even with 1x ratio of beads, uh, you're not able to get rid of the, ada the um, adapter dimer at that size. So the approach we've taken with the ultra-low kit is to use a small universal adapter which does not contain indexes or the P5, P7 sequences. And this adapter is only about 26 base pairs. So when you go through the ligation and then PCR amplification to add the indexes, uh, your final amplified sequence is bigger than the adapter dimer will be. That's shown on the next slide. Um, the adapter dimer would be about 52 base pairs, and we can see that the beads, even at 1x, can cut off and get rid of that adapter dimer. So anything above that would be recoverable um, library. So uh, this is the protocol with the um, 
changes that we've made, which basically is only in the amount of beads. No changes have been made to the time of the protocol. And uh, this is an experiment showing basically what you would see on the bioanalyzer. If you had a 20 base pair fragment, so this is working with a synthetic oligo, you can see the 20 base fragment on the bioanalyzer. When you ligate your adapters, we can see that ligated molecule there and the adapter dimers here just above the molecular weight marker. After cleaning that up, here's what your um, uh, double adapted insert looks like. And after PCR then, you can see uh, it migrates here with the primers down here. And after cleanup, we can end up with our 20 base pair library with no uh, parent adapter dimer. Uh, so we tried this with a range of synthetic oligos from 10 to 90 base pairs. On the left, it shows the actual oligos themselves as they appear on the bioanalyzer. And then on the right, we show the final library after the cleanup. And so really only in the case of the 10 base pair oligo were we not able to recover uh, a double adapted library with no uh, adapter dimer contamination. So next I'll show you some cell-free DNA libraries that we made. Uh, we purchased the cell-free DNA from Biochain and here just looking at the raw DNA on the bioanalyzer, the insert um, or the fragment size is around 177 base pairs. That's one nucleosome unit and this sample was contaminated with some larger genomic DNA. So we made two libraries, one with 250 picograms and one with one nanogram, and we use different PCR cycles. And the final library, you can see we got a good recovery of um, a 300 base pair peak, which is the size with the adapters on. And uh, you can now see a dinucleosomal size peak. And for control, we just use a sheared uh, genomic DNA of about 300 base pairs. Uh, when we ran this on the MySeq and we mapped to the human genome to get the insert size, uh, we came up with the expected 165 nucleosomal insert and the dinucleosomal 330 base pair insert. Plus you could see all of these small fragments that go down even down to 50 or so base pairs. And then uh, we saw that with either the 250 picogram or the 1 nanogram. And this, again, is just the 50 nanogram of genomic DNA showing you the 300 base pair uh, uh, average insert with a, a pretty broad range of recovered sizes. We sent this out for deep sequencing, and that's shown on this slide. Um, we sampled the reads down to get approximately the same coverage. So for the 50 nanograms of genomic, we had about 386 million reads. So we sampled down our one nanogram sample to about the same level. And we achieved a very good mapping efficiency for both of these libraries. And um, we uh, achieved actually quite good genomic coverage with only about 5%, 4%, uh, zero coverage. Um, you can see that the CFDNA had somewhat lower uh, library size estimated, and that's to be expected because basically you're looking at small chunks of degraded DNA that were floating in the blood. Um, and the one nanogram uh, cell-free DNA showed duplication level really similar to what we saw with the 50 nanogram genomic DNA. Um, some other real data that I can show you is uh, this is with a collaborator that's working on um, chip in yeast. And um, by their standard protocol for a particular uh, site that they're looking at, this is the kind of signal that they were able to see with only about 1.5 log 2 uh, chip signal in this locus and a fairly broad peak. Uh, when they used our small insert protocol, they were able to narrow that down and get a much stronger signal at this location. So they were very happy with this um, increased signal. And uh, they were able to see this at multiple sites across the genome. So in summary, um, 
the ultra low kit can allow you to make high quality libraries from both ultra small fragments of DNA from whatever protocol you might be using and from very low inputs. Um, and most of this is due to our small mini adapter which makes uh, size selection and bead cleanup possible. And I'll end the talk there and thank you for listening and you can contact me directly at this email and I'll say thanks to our R&D colleagues who did all the work with these samples, Mike Lotus, Svetlana, and Brandon. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Scott, for that uh, great presentation. Um, let's see if we get some questions coming in. Oh, it's, oh boy, lots of them came through in here. Okay, hold on one sec. Uh, nine, six. Yes, we will um, have a recording of this. Oh, we'll talk about that at the end, but we'll send everybody an email letting you know that the webinars are available for download as well as the slides. What about small RNA from RIP experiments? Scott, do you want to take that one? Uh, yeah, we haven't directly done any small RNA experiments, but once your RNA has been converted into a double-strand DNA, so your first strand of cDNA and then your second strand synthesis, once it's a small DNA sample, this protocol should be perfectly appropriate for it. Um, right, we just... Even with the low input. Right, and we just don't sell a kit uh, that's complete for doing small RNA. Uh, experiments at this point. So you'd have to make the double-stranded cDNA and then uh, use that in the library prep with our kit. Okay. All right. Well, it looks like we've got all the questions answered. Thank you all for uh, the great questions. Let's see. The second webinar is um, by Phil Farrelly. Phil, as I said, is our collaborator at Hudson Robotics. And uh, his team, him and his team have been working to automate um, a related kit to the NextSeq Ultra Low Kit that Scott just mentioned. It's called the NextSeq Amp Free Low DNA Library Kit. That kit is a PCR free fragment DNA library prep kit. And um, we've been working closely with Phil and his team, as I said. And um, Phil's going to talk about the advantages of automating sample prep for NGS uh, with a specific focus on the NextSeq Amp Free Kit automation. So uh, take it away, Phil. Hello, I'm Phil Farrelly, CEO of Hudson Robotics. I'm here today to discuss the advantages you can gain by automating Lucigen's AMP-free low DNA library kit rather than doing the process manually. First, let me give you a little background about Hudson Robotics if you're not already familiar with us. We're one of the most experienced lab automation companies in the business. We were founded 35 years ago in 1983 to market robots and automation controls. We are the first company ever to integrate personal computers with robots and third-party lab instruments. Um, we delivered the first system in 1984. 1989, we developed the first Windows-based multitasking scheduler for lab robot systems. We were for many years a systems integrator for both lab and industrial applications. And as a result of that, we've gained extensive process control experience in GMP environments. And since 1998, we have focused mainly on automating life science research applications. And that's where we came into the idea of automating next-gen sequencing prep processes. So why automate lab processes at all? Well, robotic systems automation works steadily and consistently, hour after hour, 24-7 if you want to. Generally, the result is an increase in volume of experimental results. The repeatable, constant behavior of automation will improve your process consistency. It will also improve data accuracy and traceability. It's a great way to better organize complex tasks so that they are done in the same way every time and that no steps are ever skipped. And maybe the most important benefit is that it will free valuable scientific staff from mundane tasks like mixing and pipetting. But people still use manual pipetting even though there's automated systems available. So why, what, are the, what are the reasons people do that? Well, one is that if your process is changing or has a lot of, needs a lot of flexibility, manual methods are far and away the most flexible thing you can do. You can change and select a variety of instruments and tools to work with your process. 
And clearly, doing things manually has a very low capital cost. Also, some processes require visual guidance about process conditions, such as things like color changes or phase transitions, which really can't be automated very efficiently. However, if your situation doesn't require these features, automation may really be of great benefit to you. Okay, what are the problems with manual pipetting? Why, why not do it? Well, manual methods very often introduce some uncertainty in sample tracking because they do require accurate manual note-taking. Uh, there's always some variability of technique among different technicians who might be doing the same task. Your processes usually suffer from inconsistent timing of execution because technicians have a lot of distractions and interruptions that robotic systems simply don't. Also, there's a high potential for process errors, especially if many samples are being put through a complex process. And then there are the usual training requirements for complex tasks, which is particularly uh, burdensome if the lab staff has occasional personnel changes. So let's get to the other side of this. Why automate your pipetting? Automated robotic systems overcome all of the liabilities we just discussed for manual methods. Consistency may be the most valuable aspect. You can trust your data because every run is done the same way every time. Once developed and programmed, the process methods are stable. Accurate sample tracking is possible by software instead of manual note-taking, and you'll reduce any effects of variability among technicians. Also, precise positioning of the robotic instrument means that no accommodations need to be made for inaccuracy inherent in manually handled devices like, for instance, handheld pipetters. In order to perform the automated version of Lucigen's AMP-free low DNA library kit, we developed this automated work cell that you see in the, in the slide. It has several features, including an eight-channel pipetter, a chilled nest, a magnetic bead nest, a shaker nest, a thermal cycler nest for the controlled temperature incubation steps, and a place for plates and tips to be stored and used. So in particular, why automate NGS sample prep? Well, at first it gives you the ability to precisely control things like tip positioning during aspiration and dispensing steps. This assures consistent mixing and also can eliminate air bubbles and pockets which commonly plague manual pipetting. And this is important with the small sample sizes of NGS sample prep. Consistent timing of reagent and sample additions is also another advantage. Again, once it is programmed, the robot does the same thing every time. There's better tracking of the method steps. If there are many steps and many samples, the automated system won't forget a step. A manual method might just occasionally do that. Well, the reduced need for extra steps to accommodate manual accuracies is also an occasional benefit, particularly those related to positioning of pipette tips with liquid handling operations. Now, setting up an automated system does take a little bit of time. But once it's done, the initial automation setup then can simply be used unchanged. So to start with, you'll need to program the system, which means developing the automated methods, testing, improving, debugging them, and then training users how to load and start the system. But then with each run, users will simply set up samples, set up reagents, and set up the labware. And then they initialize the system and whatever instruments might be involved, and then just run the process. So once the programming is done, which is the involved part, all the rest is just consistent and, and fairly simple to do. Here is a, a view of some tables that show the uh, Lucigen's AMP-free kit that we ran. What we're doing is running 48 different libraries simultaneously to maximize the efficient use of the sequencer. This is shown in the upper table, where we're starting with samples of 100 nanograms of 48 different libraries. In the lower table, we show the positions of what uh, Lucigen calls adapters, 
which are essentially barcodes, which go a different barcode into each of the, well, uh, the sample wells. And what they do is they tag the DNA fragments with the identity of the well that they came from so that when you do mix them all to get efficient use of the sequencer, you can separate out the individual samples and the sequenced base pairs as a result. So what we're doing in the Lucigen protocol is we're using 48 libraries in every other row, A, C, E, and G. And this way we're going to get the most efficient use of the sequencer to keep costs down. Each sample gets a Lucigen adapter with a different barcode. And then we go through a series of steps to make this all happen. We do things like add water to each well, add the DNA samples, add reaction buffer, enzyme, mix, incubate, add the adapters, we add ligase, ligase we add magnetic beads to each well, well <laughs> mix and incubate them. And then we do all the other things on this page as well. We'll activate the magnetic nest, discard the supernatant, add two rounds of ethanol to rinse and wash the beads, add a lucian buffer, mix, incubate, activate the magnetic nest, transfer supernatant to a new plate, and then we do it again. <laughs> we add new beads, mix, incubate, have two cycles of ethanol, rinse and wash, add elution buffer, mix, incubate, activate the magnetic nest, and ultimately transfer 20 microliters of each sample supernatant to a new plate, and then we're done. Well, that's, that's about almost 20 steps in all of this, and they need to be done in the right order, and no steps skipped. And tips have to be changed periodically to, well, with just about with every sample, actually, to uh, avoid cross-contamination. As you might imagine, if you're trying to do 48 samples, assuring that you accurately do it with all those samples can be a, a very daunting task. So we can see that running 48 different libraries is tedious and requires focus. We need to make sure that all 48 adapters get into the proper well. We need to assure the tips are changed between all pipetting steps. We need to make sure the correct DNA sample goes into the correct well and the correct sample volume is dispensed. We also need to be sure that all protocol, ste protocol steps are completed and in their proper order with the correct timing. Well, manually, it's very easy to misplace an adapter or a DNA sample. And when you have to do so many tip changes to avoid cross-contamination, it's easy to forget whether you change tips or not and occasionally skip that step. And all these things cause problems in the reliability and accuracy of the data you might get. Automation is going to avoid this. Automated processing of the 48 library solves all of these problems. The automated work cell overcomes all the difficulties on the previous slide. It enables consistent liquid level dispensing to prevent bubbles, which harm the proper mixing. It can prevent unwanted liquid transfer from liquid on the outside of the tips just through uh, the proper technique, and it'll do this consistently. Mixing methods themselves can protect, uh, prevent the introduction of bubbles, and we can eliminate redundant ethanol rinses because of the predictability of pipette positioning. So instead of the two rinse steps in each of those uh, the, the rinse operations, we can probably just do one and save all the, the wasted tips and the time to do this. So just to go over it again, what we did in automating Lucigen's AMP-free kit was to do 48 samples simultaneously with 48 different adapter, call them barcodes. And here are the results. We got very consistent library yields. All were in about that 2 to 3 nanogram per microliter range that's necessary for accurate sequencing. Now just to, you know, if um, uh, you notice there is a blank slot here and that's probably because some information was missing uh, for that particular sample and uh, I'm told, I'm, I'm an engineer, but I'm told by the people who, who know this kind of business that that's actually pretty common among, when you're doing a lot of samples like this. But what happened was we wound up getting a read number in each 
library that correlates very well with the volume input. The consistency of the automated prep meant that the libraries didn't even need to be normalized before loading the sequencer. Plus, if you notice down in the bottom, we have an, at an average read number of just over 600,000 reads per library. And at 150 base pairs per read, that's 91 million base pairs on average. That means that the average was very nearly 10 times the total size of the E. coli genome, which is 4.6 4 million base pairs. Just another way of expressing the results, over 96% of the reads were successfully mapped to the reference genome. And the coverage was nearly 10 times the size of the genome, which is, uh, I'm told, is a very uh, good result. Um, the insert size was very close to the 300 base pairs, which, is, which was sought by this. So we had a, the, the automated system produced a very good uh, outcome, and in fact, far better than a parallel manual process that we did at the same time. So just uh, to kind of go back over it, the, the system that does all this was pictured here. It's a very simple, small system. It'll fit in most uh, biosafety cabinets. And uh, you can, uh, Hudson isn't the only company that makes systems like this, but I think that we have the simplest and easiest to use. But here's a, um, a, a thing that you can get with automation. Automation is scalable. So if you start by just, say, automating the sample prep uh, process for NGS, you can add at any time automated plate loading and tip loading so that you can increase the volume of your experiments dramatically. Now Hudson makes a number of different automated uh, microplate loaders and here's just an example of what we make. We have a um, two different robot arms that we use and then we have a uh, stacker and track based system that can feed multiple instruments. And this can give you an idea of what you just can add to a, a, a simple work cell like the one we started with. You can also add other features, for example, bulk reagent dispensing or plate washing for doing things like ELISA's if you care to get multiple uses out of, out of the liquid handling system. Also other applications. Here's a picture of our molecular biology workstation. And other, uh, other things we do with the same basic pipetting system. If you look on the left, that, uh, that pipetting system, uh, only a part of it is needed to do gene assembly operations. And on the right, there's a picture of our DNA extraction work cell. Now the, the Lucigen uh, kit starts with purified DNA. But if you need to start earlier than that, with just a few additions to a liquid handling system like the one that did the sample prep, you can actually start with the DNA source and extract it and, uh, and automatically move right on to your DNA prep. And then the, the possibilities are almost endless. Here, for instance, is a, uh, a several systems that you utilize the same kind of equipment that the little work cell started with. Up on the upper right corner, we have an intelligent gene factory. And th this one assembles genes from sequences that are downloaded over the internet and actually manufactures oligos and then ultimately assembles genes all in that system that you see here. And that's a combination of some of the devices that we were, we were looking at earlier. And then we have a big manufacturing system that makes uh, messenger RNA by in vitro transcription. But again, it, it's just a combination of all these uh, extra automated pieces that can be scaled up from a, an initial work cell once you accept that automation is going to help your process. Now, a lot of people might think that automation is complex even for someone to sit down and use. Well, once the programming and, and the other preliminary steps are settled and the method is, is established, screens like the one shown in this slide are, can be developed that cover up any of the complexity of the programming and the other tools and they just lead the operator step by step through the operation 
So that training can be as simple as just following the graphic. <laughs> and this, uh, this software enables operators to be guided through every step so that if you do change personnel, for example, the training process is very minimal. So just to summarize, why automate lab processes and, of course, this NGS prep in particular? Well, increasing the volume of experimental results, as we've shown, doing 48 libraries simultaneously is readily done. Uh, the improvements in process consistency should actually be obvious if you think about what the automation system does. And because of this consistency, the accuracy of the data can be trusted. Improving traceability uh, of the results by tying individual samples using software to your record keeping instead of doing manual tracking. And, you know, maybe again the, the most important thing would be to va free valuable scientific staff from mundane tasks like mixing and pipetting. Well, thank you very much for listening to my presentation and uh, looking at our slides. And now uh, we'll uh, open up the uh, webinar to any questions you might have. Again, thank you. Oh, thanks, Phil. That was great. Um, we do have some questions that have come in. So let's uh, start um, from Anna D. The question was, uh, is this automation robot only available for the Lucigen protocol? And Phil, I'll let you take that one. <laughs> um, no, it, it, it's actually a very uh, multi-purpose system. It, uh, it will not just do Lucigen's protocol, but any that are automatable. Now, Lucigen's um, happens to be ha have a very good quality of being automatable. Uh, not every process is. Remember when I had that slide on uh, why do manual um, operations. And sometimes uh, there are things that you need to do that require visual confirmation uh, that really don't lend themselves to automation. So it depends on what kit you're talking about. Uh, generally speaking, the, the um, <clears throat> accessories and, and the work cell that I showed you, uh, is cap th that combination is capable of doing many different things, including other kits if they don't require um, such things as visual guidance or confirmation, or if they don't require handling uh, perhaps large vessels that are just not uh, easily done. Otherwise, um, yeah, it could be used in a number of different kits and applications. Cool. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, one of the uh, nice features of the NextSeq Amp Free and the Ultra Low kits that Scott talked about was that the enzymatic steps that Scott showed in his library construction, all the way from end repair and A-tailing up to adapter ligation, those all occur with our kit in the same tube, so there's no need to transfer tubes from or from plate to plate if you're trying to automate, which is really good. And part of the reason why we can actually uh, use such low input amounts for both kits. Okay, so uh, a couple other questions here. Uh, first of all, and these are related, so let's go price of the robot, Phil, and then advantages of the Hudson system over um, Hamilton or the other competitors that are out there. Um, Price-wise, it, it depends on what your the particular kit uh, requires. The one that we showed, that work cell, the basic uh, solo pipetter, that's our brand name for it, is under $30,000. Uh, when you add the accessories that are shown in that particular work cell, the list price is going to be in the seventy dollars to $80,000 range. Um, comparing that to other uh, brands that are out there uh, on, the, on the market. I'd say our biggest advantage is just the ease in w with which you can develop and modify or um, maintain different protocols on the system. Uh, I, I know from people's experience that uh, have used some of our competing systems, they, uh, they require a great deal of training in order to use properly. And the Hudson software and the simplicity of the device um, are just shine through when, when people compare those two. If you look at the Solo Pipetter, it's basically a robot arm, a three-axis robot arm with a, with a, a, a pipette head attached. Uh, it's that simple. And the, all the accessories are easily triggered and controlled through our software with very, very little training involved. So I, I'd say that those, that's the main place where we, we compete. Um, quite often, we're also much more um, economical. 
our prices tend to be lower than the big guys, and I'm not quite sure all the reasons for that. But uh, uh, so that that I hope that answers your question. Uh, one last question: um, Has Hudson ever worked with BioSearch technologies? BioSearch? No, I don't. No, we have not. Not to my knowledge. It's um, BioSearch is actually one of our new sister companies. So uh, not long ago. Lucigen was bought by LGC, and uh, before that, they had purchased or acquired uh, BioSearch Technologies, which is uh, a great oligosynthesis company, really good at making modified oligos, high-quality oligos. And uh, okay. so, there you go, Phil. Now you know. <laughs> okay. Well, All thank right. you, Rob. You're welcome. I'm here to help. Uh, Okay, everybody. So um, it looks like we don't have any other questions coming through. So thank you all for uh, sitting in on our two webinars. Oop. Uh, there's one more question. Let's get to that before from Joe. Uh, how long did it take to process the 48 samples with the automated system that you developed, Phil? Uh, I believe it was about six hours in total with all the incubation steps and, and everything else. I, I can get that number for you. I, you know, I, I probably should have had that right right to hand, but I, I'm not entirely uh, sure of it, but it was around six hours. Okay, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, Joe, if you want to send an email to tech, to our tech support team, we can make sure that we get that answer to you. Um, when we do this manually with a couple samples, um, the AMP-free protocol is about two hours and ten minutes. Um, but again, that is, you know, uh, just a couple samples, not, not 48 or 96 if, if you were doing a plate. So, all right. So, Thank you all again. Oh, all right. We got more questions coming in. So, lowest pipettable volume with your system, Phil? Uh, it's a fraction, about a half a microliter, and that, that's if you're talking about reasonable CVs, like uh, five to ten percent CVs. And you know, when you get down to that uh, level, the um, technique is actually more important than the system itself. And I'll give you an example of why. Our uh, 200 microliter pipette head, which that's the capacity of each of the tips, um, is broken into 10,000 steps. So theoretically, you can get um, 0.02 microliters resolution from any pipetting step. Uh, so uh, the, the mechanical system is perfectly capable of doing something like that. However, the reality is that uh, things like liquid uh, um, fluid mechanics and droplet sizes and the viscosity of the fluids that you're you're handling uh, will reduce the accuracy of pipetting at those levels to something that's more controlled by technique like for example tip touches or aspirate over aspirating and then dispensing a little first and then going and dispense and things that sometimes take a little more time to get the accuracy so it's difficult to answer your question without reference to the specific fluid um, however, we, we do know that we've gotten excellent CVs down to half a microliter with the right technique and the right pipette head. Okay, super. Thanks, Phil. All right, so now I'm going to wrap up. Uh, <laughs> thanks for the great questions, though. No, really, it, it's wonderful to have uh, engagement when we do these webinars and hear from our customers. All right, so thank you both, uh, Scott and Phil, for the wonderful um, webinars that you each did. And thank you, audience, again, for joining us today. We know you're busy, and it's, it's great that you could take the time out of your day to uh, listen in on Scott and Phil. Um, as we said, if you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to shoot, them, shoot an email to our tech support team or give them a call. You can get the uh, phone number on our website, but the email address is there. It's techserve at lucigen.com. And then, um, as I said earlier, we'll post the webinar recordings in a couple of days uh, to our website, and we'll also send you out uh, an email alerting you to that. If you registered for this event, we'll send you an email alerting you to the webinar recording being available, as well as uh, a PDF of each set of slides that were used today. So uh, thanks again for everyone for joining us, and um, we'll sign off for now, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day wherever you may be in the world. Take care, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Hopefully, we'll see you soon in another webinar.